right, so I'm Michael Olson. My talk's going to be uh, from Marmalade to Emacs. The uh, target audience for this is authors of, uh, well, multiple actually, authors of uh, add-ons to Emacs that may have already gotten them into ELPA, ELGET, or Marmalade that might be interested in getting them into Emacs uh, itself. Um, also, this, this might be an area, too, where, where power users with some degree of project management skill are interested in getting into that. Uh, could potentially work with an add-on maintainer to help them get code into DMX. Um, and uh, there's also also some in here for uh, authors of relatively new add-ons who would like to keep their options open for, for getting code in DMX. And uh, sorry for the deceptive title, but this isn't at all about uh, ELP, ELG, or Marmalade. So what I'm going to get into is, uh, I'm hoping to cover with this talk is, uh, why get code in Emacs? Licensing concerns, especially with respect to Debian. Uh, assessing the amount of works so that you don't get in over your head and, and get a good idea of what exactly is ahead of you. Um, bookkeeping practices for new contributions, whether you keep an eye on the work, and best practices for maintaining a fork. So, first of all, before I go any further, I want to introduce a term that I just uh, made up to, to help me describe this, which is uh, Emacs Ready. And, uh, for this to apply to your project, the copyright has to be fully assigned to FS, the Free Software Foundation, and has to be in terms of the name of your particular project, uh, not, not just DMX. And uh, at, at this point, it could go into DMX with a small amount of technical effort or uh, consent from an DMX maintainer. So, a little bit about me. I maintained uh, ERC, the EMAX IRC client, for Two years and uh, helped to get it into Emacs, and it's it's basically uh, I'm drawing a bit from my experiences with that in, in uh, this particular talk. Also maintained uh, Emacs News, which is similar to Org, um, and it backed publishing in Planner Mode for a while. Uh, also maintained EMS for a while, and wrote the MPD backend for it. And those last two are Emacs ready, but not actually part of Emacs. But uh, I believe last time I checked, you can find them from ELPA. So first of all, let's start off with the question of why would you want to go through all this effort in the first place? Well, you could see a pretty huge user base increase if you're out on if you, uh, if you get it into Emacs, and it, it definitely generates a lot of excitement for those Emacs users who like to go through release notes of uh, the latest Emacs and try to decide whether or how quickly they want to install it. Um, and this also helps your code out a bit because uh, when Emacs maintainers are implementing new features and deprecating old functions and variables, they'll uh, if, your, if your code is in the Emacs code base, they'll catch those for you most of the time and, and just fix them up. It's also, uh, I don't know, it can be a great resume addition. So you have code in Emacs, it's worked for me anyways. Uh, you can think of it also as a time capsule. I mean, it's, Emacs has been around for 37 years, and I don't see any reason why it couldn't go on for another 37. But uh, it's, it's, not, it's not all upsides. There, there's a lot, of, a lot of things I have to keep in mind. One of those is that contributors with more than 12 or so non-trivial lines of code uh, do have to have copyright assignments sent in. And I've, I've provided a link here for uh, the documentation on how to do this. Uh, thankfully, uh, in, in recent years, uh, FSF has uh, put this particular page up, and uh, they, they hadn't when I, when I first got into this. It would have made things a lot easier. Uh, one thing that you'll definitely have to do is keep track of authorship and reach out to contributors as a result of this. So if you have a, if you have a large existing code base, you may need to pinch or reach out to multiple people and ask them for copyright assignments. Um, and the link that I provided there does have several template, templates that you can use that are just basically copy and paste that you can uh, use in email messages to contributors. Although uh, you, picking exactly the right way to ask is somewhat of an art in itself. Uh, you, you also need to get copyright assignment from, from your own place of work. And usually, uh, See, it seems like employers are, are fairly willing to do this nowadays. It's just it's just a matter of waiting waiting it out. And the uh, and the initial effort definitely can be challenging, although uh, keeping up with it afterwards isn't isn't nearly as bad. This is, this is the part that's that's by far the worst. Is if you can't get a copyright assignment from someone and you're determined to get your code into Emacs, then you pretty much have to have to either omit that particular piece of code or rewrite it which is uh, kind of painful, and uh, also certain social trade-offs for that matter. And the process, you, you, should, you should basically expect this to take half a year or more if the code has many contributors. 
um, especially if you haven't done any bookkeeping at, at all for this in the past. Um, also, users of the add-on, another thing to be aware of is that if, you're, if your add-on uh, makes frequent re releases, then you'll have to be aware that the version of your add-on in Emacs may not see those features quite as quickly as, as your own, uh, as they normally would. And that's one reason why uh, I, know, I think org mode in particular has decided to keep a fork of their code so that they can get quick releases out to their power users. And then for, for everyone else, there's, you know, they can just use the version that, that comes in Emacs and doesn't require any additional setup. So for, I'm going to highlight a few social concerns here because some of, some of these can be a bit surprising. So your code will need to be GPL v3. The WTF license won't work here. Uh, your documentation is recommended to be GFDL, but maintainers can and usually do ex can, uh, accept a looser license like GPL or LGPL if you insist on it. Uh, and the reason why this is an issue is because the Debian project decided in I believe 2006 or 2007 as a, just as a general resolution to not accept GFDL documentation into the main repo for Debian. Uh, that, is not, that is not correct. Debian does not accept the GFDL documentation if they use invariant sections. If they don't, it's okay. okay. I personally disagree with Debian. Yeah, well, I wasn't 100% if, if, they, if they made that distinction or not. Uh, uh, I've recently spoken with the Debian project leader. Okay. Well, the reason, I, I bring it, the reason it's important anyways is because a large percentage of the time, at least five years ago, you will have invariant sections in your, in your manuals. Like, even... Like if you just do like a random sample manuals out there, probably about 90% of them have invariant sections. So, for all, for all, for all intents and purposes, you know, well, that, Emacs says so. Yeah, and Emacs in particular. I mean, and, and part of part of the trade-off too is, is that I mean, it's a trade-off between being able to freely modify the manual and making sure that you're met, that you have if you have a message that it gets across unadulterated. And that was the particular part that I believe uh, Richard Stallman was uh, concerned about. And one of the reasons that he put invariant section into shift field documentation in the first place. Um, I mean, I, don't, I, don't, I, won't, I won't get into that into which which side of that which which uh, side of that I fall on, but I will point out though that that um, as a result of this, pretty much all of the Emacs manuals are not included with the Debian version of Emacs by default. You do have to install a separate package with the name non -DF DSFG in it to get those manuals. Stand corrected DFSG, and, uh, and I, will point, I will point out here that Ubuntu will install this for you. With that, with that covered, how to how to get your code to the state where it's considered Emacs ready, where it could go into Emacs if you had maintainer consent. So first, obvious thing we need to do is track down anyone who's contributed code. Um, if your project already has a, an author's file or, or some place for keeping track of it. And that would be a good place to keep it updated. And if it doesn't have one, you, you may want to consider making one. Um, you, you could just keep a private list if you wanted to, but it, it does mean that if, if, it's, if it's on just your own computer, then it's, it, it can be prone to be misplaced. So there, there are trade-offs there. Uh, another thing that will take some time is uh, making sure that you're looking through all the logs very, very carefully. Because uh, in some cases, especially before Git came along, um, if, if someone was installing a change on behalf of someone else, like the change would be in the name of the committer, not the name of the actual author. So you, you may need to look for certain keywords in commit messages to find those cases. Um, and one, one method that I, that I recommend is I, I basically like, I like to use uh, git log dash p as a Swiss army knife for this kind of thing because it basically gives you the full disk and the commit message in a, in a really easy, typeable, typeable and searchable way. Uh, and that can be helpful for just kind of eyeballing all of the, uh, the list of authors. And then, and then once you once you have the list and you and you've counted the number of non-trivial modified lines, and and by this I mean you can throw out it, you you can throw out any lines that have indentation changes or really really trivial changes, like maybe change the name of a, of a variable or something like that. Um, and if you and if, if after doing that you have more than twelve lines, then you need to start making uh, emails in large bulk. So, again, here's the link to uh, for how to send those out.
one thing I'd recommend you do is if, if you have more than, like, say, two or three of these, you may want to contact the FSF copyright clerk at uh, assignatgnu.org and get their help on, uh, on how to do this and get, and get their advice as well. Uh, another potential, potential gotcha to be aware of is that the, the FSF may want you to assign changes uh, in the name of your program as opposed to uh, in the name of Emacs itself. And the, the distinction is, is important, and you may want to preemptively ask employers to assign both of those so that because uh, if, your, if your code does go into Emacs, then if any further changes you make to it, you need to have a, a, a contribution uh, made out for Emacs as well. So that's something that can save you time uh, if, you, if you take care of that. Uh, and another thing you want to do is you want to decide how long you're willing to wait for people to respond. Um, and depending on, on how, how active the project is, it, it could take quite a while. And if you can't get a hold of them, then you may need to consider rewriting their contributions or just omitting them. Uh, how, how the process actually works is people will usually, as, as a result of the, the template that you paste in the email message, it'll tell people to mail con uh, to get uh, papers printed out, signed by the employer, and then mail them to the Free Software Foundation, who then contact you as the maintainer when they come in. Um, and depending on the, the, the sheer number of people that you contact, they, they may or may not give you a, a GNU shell account with read-only access to the uh, master copyright assignment file, which is just randomly on their, on their file system. And one, one of the perks of doing that is you get a GNU.org email address, although it's not a sufficient reason to uh, undertake this endeavor by itself. And uh, once you get all the copyright notices in, then you'll need to go through and change all of the uh, copyright notices in all source code files to read like this, where you have uh, just a unified range of dates where uh, usually usually you want to use the same range of dates in all of your files. So basically take the, the file with the earliest modification and the file with the latest, or, or you can use the current year and just use that range in, in all of your files. It used to be that you had to list out every single individual year, but thankfully they dropped that requirement because that was pretty odious to deal with. Uh, you should also note in the, in the copyright notice um, that the, the add-on is, is not part of the GNU Emacs, or just make sure that if you're, if, you, if you're copying existing copyright notice from an Emacs file that you get rid of the part that says this file is part of GNU Emacs. Either one of those would be acceptable. Um, if copyright notices are missing from files and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and they're considered source and the source is uh, non-trivial and reasonably easy to modify, like it has a comment syntax, then you may want to go ahead and, and just uh, add a copyright notice for that. Once you've done that, then your code is nominally Emacs ready and it's time to start uh, talking to uh, various maintainers and the Emacs film list and try to gauge interest in, in actually uh, having the code go into Emacs. And this isn't a strict ordering. I mean, you, you may want to, for example, contact maintainers first before you even decide to go down this road, um, just because of the amount of, the amount of effort involved. But going forward, as your contributions come in, you'll, you'll want to keep the author's file up to date, of course. Uh, one, one further step before you start contacting people is if, if the project or add-on is large, then you may be required to produce a manual in uh, text info format. So it might be a good idea to begin that. Um, although if, if it's just like one or two files, then that, that might not be a big deal. But uh, the, the, the text info part is important because last time I checked, they, would not, they, won't, they will not accept like HTML documentation or Auto, even auto-generated text info could be used as a starting point if you have uh, like a, a wiki language or something that can publish to that format, but you'll need to actually maintain the real thing in text info format. Um, and then depending on your comfort level, uh, you need to reach out to either the Emacs development list or uh, Stefan Manier or Chong Yudong or uh, uh, Richard Stallman for that matter and uh, it's a good idea for if they're interested in including your code in Emacs or not. Um, and you also want to be sure that there aren't in, any existing add-ons like what you what like what you're maintaining already in Emacs. If so, you'll need to describe what the differences are, and and what what benefit users would see from having your version, uh, your add-on in Emacs as opposed to, or in addition to the existing one. And then here once again, once once you get your code into Emacs, you'll you'll need to make sure that you have a copyright assignment on on the record for Emacs itself.
and then uh, actually getting code in. If the maintainers agree to accept your code, they'll tell you uh, which branch you're checking into. It may or may not be the master branch. They they might potentially tell you to check it into a release branch also, depending on how they're how they're managing it. Uh, you'll you'll get right access to uh, the actual Emacs itself at that point most of the time. Um, and you'll need to learn uh, how to use GNU Bazaar if you haven't already. This is, uh, if I may make a brief editorial, I think this is highly, highly unfortunate that Emacs maintainers have decided to use uh, BZR when pretty much 90% of the world is using Git. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But if, if your add-on is large, uh, you may need a new directory added to the source tree with the make file. Uh, existing directory is probably fine. And the maintainers will, uh, will tell you what to do. Uh, so in document, another thing you need to be aware of is that documentation and miscellaneous files. If, if there's something that you actually want to distribute with EMX, they'll need to go into separate uh, separate directories, which, which may or may not map exactly to how you originally had them in your, in your source code. So you may need to en end up making, like if, you, if you want to end up maintain your own fork, you, you will have to make, you probably want to make some kind of import and export script that just copies files from one location to the other just to make your life simpler. Uh, at this point, you'll need to go through and change all the copyright notices, make sure that, make sure that it, at this time that you know that they're part of the new Emacs. You'll need to prepare a short summary of the new features list for the next Emacs release. And be aware that it, it may potentially take a year or two for, if, if it's slated for the next major release for, for, that, for that code to go out. And there is some discussion going on about this on the Emacs list, but uh, last time I checked, but you, you will also need to maintain a separate changelog file which is basically similar to uh, the commit messages you use for checking in, but it has a very specific syntax and indentation and various standards around that that you'll need to uh, be aware of. And basically, you'll need to update that file usually with every every commit or uh, occasionally with after a series of, of small commits. Um, and the reason, the reason why that's kind of a questionable practice is because it, it introduces a lot of if you have a lot of contributors modifying the same file, you know, that, that's, that's pretty much a guaranteed merge conflict every time. If you have people working on parallel codes, that's why it's not a particularly great practice in, in that sense, although uh, I can see some arguments being made for readability of, of changelog versus having to actually go to, you know, the bizarre log and try to interpret that up. But, uh, so the next question that you have once once you get your code into Emacs is whether you want to continue maintaining your own fork of it, or whether you want to just say that the version in Emacs is the canonical one. Um, it, it used to be that you'd want to maintain a fork for the sake of your X Emacs or Emacs 21 users back when. I'm kind of dating myself here, but this is back in 2007 when Emacs 22 was taking a while to come out. But that's that's not really much of a concern anymore because X Emacs support has pretty much dwindled, and um, and the, the release schedule for Emacs has really picked up a lot. I mean, current maintainers have done a really great job with that. Uh, another th the thing to consider is if you don't, if you if you have a large active community around your add-on, uh, like like org mode does, for example, then you may want to maintain a fork for that reason, so you can get quick releases out to them. And uh, just briefly go into some best practices for actually maintaining the uh, like dealing dealing with the fork. So you probably want to dedicate a branch for it, um, for example, Emacs-24. And you want to be very, very careful about what you, what you put into that branch. Uh, like the, the conventions that I've adopted are basically, that branch has to, has to include exactly the content of, of your add-on that is in Emacs, like right at the moment, or at the last time that you synced up with it. So what you want to do before, like before you even like migrate changes from your fork into Emacs, or vice versa, is you want to make sure that that particular branch is up to date. Um, by use of like an import or export script, and you want to have the file layout in that branch be exactly the same, preferably as the uh, file layout in your fork. And the reason for that is that that git merge just works, and you don't have to. Uh, I mean, you you could potentially rely on the subtree merge and, and hope that that works, but it's it it's just much more of a, a fail proof this way. Let's see. Yeah, the process of doing this is, is a bit involved. You'll have to basically, 
like usually what I, what I do when I when I maintain this for ERC is I, I would start out with Emacs 24 branch, uh, run a script to sync changes from Emacs into that branch, check those in, and then uh, mer merge them back into the fork, summarize them, and uh, resolve conflicts, merge back, and then copy the files to Emacs source tree. Um, and and of course before you actually check that in, you'll probably want to run at least the bare minimal compile and, and use test, otherwise uh, people will get angry with you for breaking their code. And uh, you also want to make sure that you don't introduce any uh, light compiler warnings or anything like that, because sometimes uh, this can get you into trouble as well. And then uh, afterwards, you'll, you'll, probably, you'll want to do a, an R style merge from Emacs 24 back to master, just to indicate that um, it basically makes git merge just work if you, if you do that. Uh, because it means that the next time you do the, this import, it'll start off from that point, uh, and, it, and it won't try to and it won't try to like read both the history of Max twenty four and the master branch and, and attempt to merge those together. And uh, when when you do commit code to Max, you want to remove any uh, compatibility hacks that you may have. And again, I'm dating myself here by mentioning this because this is much less of an issue. Um, and when you, and if if the need arises to actually introduce a new compatibility hack into your into your fork, like for example, if let's say Emacs 24 is using a particular function name and Emacs 23 doesn't have that yet, but you need that functionality, then uh, one way of dealing with that is to basically use a eval when compile block and then set a and if it's a function, you can just set a, a, a def alias at that point, and uh, and the name that you choose needs to be prefixed with your project's namespace. Like you should, you absolutely should not be trying to, defining functions like format string that are in a particular version of Emacs. Otherwise, you'll create a lot of trouble for pretty much any any other add-on authors out there. Um, let's see, and, uh, and one one good result of doing this during uh, eval when compile is that uh, it, it's it's pretty fast. I mean, alias is, isn't isn't bad at all. That's all I've got. Any questions? I hate change logs as much as the next man, uh, but one minor point is that if you're using um, if you're using Git um, and uh, to, to maintain your project and pushing changes from that into Bazaar, which quite a few projects are, uh, if you look in the Git repositories for GNU Core Utils or GNU Lib, uh, you will see uh, you, you will see a, scr a script which can, which creates a GNU change log from a from a Git log, so you don't need to maintain it by hand, um, and another script which can handle merge conflicts in change logs. Um, okay. Which is quite nice. You can almost forget the horrible things exist in that situation. <laughs> do, you still, do, you still, do you still have to manually like I have all the results and pick them, or is it pretty? It solid? does. It's automatic. You can completely ignore it. Um, can you call you tools? It doesn't bother to maintain change logs anymore. It just generates them at release time and shoves them in the table. It works pretty much perfectly. Okay, that's good to hear. Yes. Anyone else? So one question from the Emacs channel: um, How um, could you comment um, on how, why Muse it did not make into Emacs core? Well, in, in part because org had org mode uh, had a, a very wide overlap with its features and had uh, had more community support at the time. So I just I just didn't even if I recall correctly, there may have been like one. I believe RMS when he maintained Emacs might have might have asked me once about it, but that, that email conversation just didn't didn't really go anywhere once he realized that org had such a, a wide overlap with it. Um, one one last question. I, sorry, I don't want you to think that I want you to be rude to you with that question. But why? I mean, why do that at all? If we are read have today ELPA and and uh, the things put inside the Max are going to be considered add-ons to Max itself. And once they are add-ons to Max itself, we cannot uninstall them even if you don't want them. Why not just leave it in ELPA and and make Emacs more modular than that? That's true. I, I could see an argument being made to that point. Um, 
the reasons for this song, I'll go back to one of my first slides here. So part, part of it is a uh, third point here in that you're, once your code is in Emacs, like it gives you, it gives you some, some assurance for the future of your project. Like you don't, you don't know whether like EL, ELPA or ELGET or Marmalade is, is ever going to be, you know, merged into Emacs itself and you don't have any assurances about that and you don't know necessarily which tool is going to be the, the dominant one in the next two or three or four years. So this, this is a way of kind of future proofing yourself with that. Also, it's, I hate to say, but there, there's, there's at least somewhat of a prestige factor with it, too. Um, although that's not a sufficient reason in itself to do it. And, and it, it definitely is the case that people are more likely to stumble across your code if, if you um, have it in Emacs, especially if, if they're a new user or a, a user that isn't enough of a power user to know, to know how to use ELGET and Marmalade or I mean, basically pretty much anyone, anyone outside of this community would would have an easier time finding your project if it was in Emacs as opposed to being in ELGET or Marmalade. Although I can, def I can definitely understand like with the, 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 number, the number of cons and amount of time involved, and this definitely requires a lot of patience to see through, like the, it, could, it could be not worth the effort to some. Anyone else? Take that as a no. Okay, put your hands together for Michael. <laughs>